when he goes back to the brothers and he gets arrested there because the, the mobs are trying to kill him. That's in Acts 21. And ultimately he's, he's sent to Caesarea because they're trying to kill him. They're, they're plotting for his life when they transport him. So they send him off to Caesarea uh, in Acts 23 where he's kept in prison for two years. Paul's imprisoned in Caesarea for two years before finally, that's under Felix, before finally appealing to Caesar. And so then he gets sent to Caesar, to, sent to Rome in Acts 27. This is, if you remember, on the way to Rome, he gets shipwrecked, right? It was a rough road. He spends several months on Malta before finally ending up in Rome in the last chapter of Acts, which is Acts 28. Now, in Rome, Paul's under house arrest. Um, he writes several letters from the prison there. We get the impression that it's a, a fairly light imprisonment uh, in the sense that he can receive guests. He, he receives all the elders of the Jews and he preaches to them. He can preach the gospel. He says, I'm chained, but the gospel's not. Um, he he so he can receive all his friends. Um, he's able to preach the gospel. He's able to write letters. And the book of Acts ends with these words. It says, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And the book ends. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a narrative record of what happens to Paul after that, but most scholars agree that that is not the imprisonment that leads to Paul's martyrdom. He is martyred in Rome after he's in jail under Nero. This would have been under Nero as well, but before Nero's persecution of the Christians began. So it's very likely that he um, got out of there. All right, He seemed to have be confident that he was going to be released. There was really very little evidence against him. The Jews didn't even show up to testify against him at first. So uh, it's likely that he was acquitted. And um, he was in Rome for another two years. So that's four years in prison. So after that two years, likely he was acquitted and then was released for probably two or three years and then ultimately rearrested brought back to Rome where he was ultimately martyred. So that's our story. In those two or three years in between, you look at different early church fathers, what they've written, what Paul wrote through his letters. It's likely that he went as far as Spain to preach the gospel and then returned back through the other churches that he's planted, possibly going through Crete at that time. Um, so we get a little sense of what's going on. Now Titus, who accompanied Paul on his second and third missionary journeys, was likely with him for part of this fourth missionary journey that he took uh, between his two Roman imprisonments. So after the first imprisonment, just a few years before his eventual martyrdom, that Paul writes this letter to Titus. All right, just to give us a little, I think it's helpful for me personally to kind of get that context, you know, to understand that Paul's been a Christian for 30 years at this point. Um, this is one of his more mature letters, you know, this, this last letter to Titus. Um, and right in the first chapter, Paul also gives us a little bit of backstory to the letter. He says that he left Titus behind in Crete uh, to finish setting up those churches. In particular, he says to appoint elders and to basically straighten out some false doctrine that had been creeping into the churches. And after that, Titus is supposed to meet Paul back up at Nicopolis. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about Titus. He's actually never mentioned in the book of Acts, uh, but we do know that he was a Gentile believer. In Galatians 2, Paul tells us that he brought Titus with him to Jerusalem and refused to have him circumcised there. Uh, he's also mentioned in 2 Corinthians several times. So it appears Paul had sent Titus to Corinth. Titus goes, checks out what's going on in Corinth and brings back a good report. You know, after that first letter of rebuke, he brings back a pretty good report. And Paul says, he writes the second letter to Corinthians after Titus had returned to him. Said, hey, Titus just got back thrilled with what I'm hearing. I'm really sorry that my letter grieved you, but I'm not so sorry. All right, that's, that's Second Corinthians in a nutshell. Um, the only other place we hear about Titus, besides the book of Titus, is in Second Timothy, which Paul probably wrote one of his last letters in his second imprisonment in Rome. He tells T Timothy, like, I'm, I'm being poured out. This is, this is the end. Uh, and he says that Titus has gone on to Dalmatia to carry on the work. So, there's our context, all right? There's a little bit of context of what's going on. We have Titus, a companion of Paul, who would have known Paul's gospel very well, uh, left behind on Crete in order to bring the churches there into better order. And as we go through this letter, we're going to see Paul address, if we have a theme that carries throughout, two major uh, problems in the Cretan churches. On the one hand, there's licentiousness. And on the other hand, there's legalism. And that's still kind of what we've got going on today. You see a lot, of, uh, a lot of that on the one hand and the other. The churches still go to those extremes. Licentiousness is basically license, licentiousness, living without a law, right? It is, it is indulging in the lust of the flesh and basically taking advantage of God's grace. 
well, God's going to forgive me anyway. And so it's living without a law. No holds bound, you know, barred. Everything's, everything's good. Now, legalism, on the other hand, binds people to a law. In effect, it tries to earn God's grace. So on the one hand, you take advantage of God's grace. On the other hand, trying to earn God's grace. So we have those two extremes, like I said, that we still see today. And uh, Paul suggests that the only solution to those two extremes is a deeper understanding of the gospel. And I, we still say that. The only, only solution to that is a, a deeper understanding of the gospel. And so we get in this letter a real solid treatment of salvation by grace and also good works as the reasonable fruit of that salvation. Paul just in, throughout this gives such a great balance of faith and works. And uh, I just feel like the Lord's been kind of taking us there. We don't know exactly when the churches on Crete were planted. It's possible that shortly before Paul leaves Titus there, that you know um, he set up the churches as he was coming out through his first Roman imprisonment. But they could have gone back decades before that, actually, because in Acts chapter 2, it tells us that there were Jews from Crete among the crowd when Peter first stands up and gives his uh, sermon at, at Pentecost. So they could have returned to Crete. We could have had Christian churches there right from the very beginning. Either way, Paul is now claiming some spiritual authority over these churches as an apostle, and he wants them to conform to the true gospel. And so we're going to get into it slowly. A lot of truth jam-packed in here. Bev, if you could put that back up. We're going to walk through these kind of verse by verse. So here we go. You ready? As I said, really, this opening is a formality um, of ancient letters, but Paul does something interesting in the process. He, he, He adds a bunch of extra stuff in here that really isn't required. So he says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our savior to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God, the father and Christ Jesus, our savior. And when you look at that, that's really one long sentence. That's just, you know, the English teacher in me kind of comes out. I'm like, all right, that's just one long sentence, you know. And if you study it grammatically, we've got the main clause, right? A clause has to have a subject and a predicate. The main clause is really this, Paul to Titus. That's the sentence. Everything else are a positive phrases, relative clauses, subordinate clauses, everything else kind of just attached to it. But the main clause is just Paul to Titus. That's it. Everything else is extra. So we're going to break it down. Paul begins by stating his name and his position. All right, he writes, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so he identifies himself in two ways. First, as a servant of God, and second, as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, many of you probably have a, a footnote in your Bibles there, under after servant, if you look, all right, uh, that, the, that the, the Greek is doulos, which is literally slave or bondman. So, Paul refers to himself that way a couple of other times uh, as a slave in Romans and Philippians. Uh, but most of his other letters, he, he simply refers to himself as an apostle of God or of Jesus Christ. Uh, and this is the only place where he refers to himself as both a slave and an apostle. So what's the big deal? Why do I stop there? Why is that significant? I think it's significant because it gives us an insight into Paul's claim to position as he writes this letter to Titus and to those who would read it. It shows us two things. First, Paul's authority, and also his humility. And see, he says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is his regular title. It means an emissary or a delegate, one sent on behalf of another. In 1 Timothy, Paul calls himself an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. By the command. I'm I'm an apostle by the command of God. In Romans He calls himself a servant or a slave called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. And it's interesting because of all that Paul could have said about himself, right? When we look at Philippians 3, 4 through 6, he says, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So he had reason to to boast. But of all that he could have said about himself, he chooses to introduce himself as one who is under authority. As an apostle, he has some authority, but he's also under authority since he's acting on behalf of somebody else, right? But he's also doubly defined 
as under someone else's authority by calling himself a slave of God. And I think it's helpful if we keep this in mind as it relates to us, right? That we don't act on our own behalf. Um, Sometimes I think we kind of get that, you know, but then you ever think you got something and then when you really look at how you're acting, you realize you don't really get it, right? So we think we get it, but then when we really look at how we behave, we kind of realize we're actually functioning under like the idea that we're only kind of rented out to God on Sundays, you know, that, that we're only kind of rented out to God temporary for like missions trips or, or, or ministry work or, you know, that not that we are all the time, you know, Some, uh, sometimes you, you get into the situation, you know, maybe there's an argument with a, in a relationship and you're like, why am I always the person who has to do the right thing? I'm tired of doing the right thing. You know what? This time you've got to do the right thing and I get to kind of be selfish, but you know what? You don't. You always have to do the right thing. You always have to do the godly thing. That's the call. That's the command. It's hard, but that's what it is. You always have to do the right thing. You always have to be the bigger man. You always have to be the godly one if you are a child of God. doesn't mean we always do it, but that's the call, right? Um, we're under the authority of another. And, and I think that's at once humbling, but also empowering in a sense. Because let's just take a real life example, right? The, uh, the honor that a foreign ambassador gets uh, depends on the honor given to the one that he represents, right? If, if he comes and he's an ally uh, representing a country, an ally who we really like, then we show great honor to that ambassador. Not because the ambassador is somebody, but because he represents a big somebody, right? The ambassador would be a fool if he shows up at a, and there's like a parade and lots of pomp and, and, and celebration and he thinks it's because people really like him, right? They're, they're changed in and changed out. People don't even know their names a lot of times. It's who they represent that's significant. It's because of who he represents. And because he represents someone else, the honor showed to that ambassador is really honor showed to the person he represents. Right? Sound familiar? Matthew 25, 40. Jesus says, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you really did it to me. Right? John 5, 23, he says, all, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So we see that there is this, this passing along of honor. When, we rep, when, when one represents somebody, as we honor that one, we honor the one that sent him. And so Paul identifies as both a slave and an apostle. And we have to realize that these are not titles he applied for, Right? These are not titles that he sought. I mentioned that last week briefly, that this is not a life that Paul chose for himself. In Colossians, Paul says that he's an apostle by the will of God. He says the same thing also in 1 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, in Ephesians, and in 2 Timothy, by the will of God. In 1 Timothy, he says, I'm an apostle by the command of God. And we see in the record of his conversion in Acts 9 that the Lord says to Ananias, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So this isn't Paul boasting when he claims to be a servant and an apostle of God. I think Paul understood what it was to be under authority. He was, in a sense, compelled to preach the gospel. He was conscripted, as it were, by the Lord into his service, right? I said last week, almost against his will, it seems. Uh, In a large sense, Paul had no choice in the matter. Uh, But the gift of God's grace is that you would never want any other choice. Isn't that true? And so Paul is at once an apostle. He's one with authority and also a slave, one under authority. His will is not his own. He serves a master. And as such, he serves a purpose that is not his own. And so after introducing his purpose here, I'm sorry, his his position here in verse one, Paul moves on to his purpose. Not the purpose of the letter, the purpose of his position. So see, why is Paul an apostle and a slave? He is a slave and an apostle, it tells us, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness and hopes of eternal life. And I'll stop right there in the middle of verse two. And we're going to piece that out a little bit, all right? He is a slave who belongs to God. He is a delegate or messenger sent from Jesus Christ for the purpose of building the faith and the knowledge of God's elect. And we talked about that word elect briefly last week as we finished up our I Believe series, Uh, but I just want to add a little bit to it this week. On the one hand, if we look at the scripture, election is an obvious doctrine. It's plain as day. I I find this really interesting. I heard uh, uh, somebody say this. 
if we were to look at the scripture alone, election is obvious. The scripture calls all those who come to faith in Christ the elect. Jesus uses the word in the Gospels. It's also found in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, in Romans, in Colossians, in 1st and 2nd Timothy, in 1st Peter, in 2nd John, and Revelation. That's 10 different books where we find that same Greek word. Six different brothers agreeing under the influence of the Holy Spirit. John addresses his second epistle to the elect. Peter says, you are a chosen generation. Same Greek word, chosen is elect. An elect generation, a royal priesthood. In 2 Timothy, Paul says he endures all things for the sake of the elect. And that's just looking at the adjective form. It actually shows up another 25 times as a verb. So there really aren't that many ways to define that, that Greek word. Chosen, picked out, elected. And it's all over the New Testament, but still people balk at it, right? People kind of hesitate over that word. Uh, and as I said, if we look at scripture alone, it's, it's clear as day. See, the problem comes, I think, when we hold that idea up against our experience yes. or our perceived experience, yeah. right? We say, oh, that's where it doesn't match. That's where we feel, because I feel like I have some control over things. Am I going to have steak or chicken tonight? I don't like to think that it was determined before the foundations of the earth that I was going to choose the chicken, right? And so we, we kind of, we get a very uncomfortable with that, like I said. Um, and I, I shared... Um, you know, many of us feel like, uh, oh, you might remember your day of salvation, right? I'm sorry. You may remember that you made a choice. I, I talked a little bit about that last week, or, or at least you felt like you made a choice. You know, I shared a part of my story last week, um, fill it out a little bit more. The day I came to salvation, I had been to church maybe three times before that, um, other than as a child. And uh, the pastor was talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm giving the story of the, the three Hebrew children in the, in the furnace, right? And he talks about how they go in and, and, and they're bound. And, and then there's a fourth one who looks like a son of the gods. And, and when they come out, they, they don't even smell like smoke, but only their bindings are burned up. In other words, they're freed in there. And he, and he, and he says, you know, if anyone wants to know that freedom of walking unbound, would this son of God come forward? It was one of those altar calls, you know, and I was like, no way am I, there's like a hundred something people in this room and I'm gonna walk up front like I know. But I, I had to, you know, my knees, maybe you had a similar experience, like my knees are knocking, my heart's like pounding and I was like, I have to walk. I was compelled. Free will? <laughs> I don't know, I, I had to go up, right? I made a choice though. My feet moved. I walked myself up to the front, to that altar. I went to one of the elders, who turns out to be my future father-in-law, and I prayed. I made my lips move. I formed those words. And you may have had a similar experience. You may have felt like you even did it. You may feel like God even congratulated you for finally choosing him, right? But I think as we mature in our faith and we grow in our walk, we, we tend to think back to that moment. We start asking questions like, how was it that I was there that night? You know, how was it that I met that person that first brought me to hear the gospel? How by chance were those circumstances that, that I even met them? How, how was it that I was born at just such a moment that I would be just such an age when he or she was just such an age and born at a place or moved to a place that our paths would cross and one day he or she would take me and tell me the gospel? How did that happen? How was it that I was in just such a place of need or maybe of panic or of desperation or emotional distress or emotional need when I heard that word, right? And that is the wonder of God. Like I said, I can't tell you one way or the other. It's been debated for a long time. Is it beyond our comprehension? Yes, but it's there. It's in scripture. And I, I finished this message on Friday, finished working on the, on the sermon. And uh, Saturday, we were holding a yard sale with Matthew, and I met a brother who, who came, and I never met him before. He fellowships at another place in town. Um, and he, he ex-biker, you know, looks like a tough dude, you know, and, and he, he starts telling me how he's like, you know, 16 years ago, I would have never thought I would have been a Christian. I would have been like, what? look at those people. I would never become one of those people, right? 
And, and he starts telling me his salvation story, how he, he goes out to California. He's like, I didn't even have the money to, to go to California. My mother gave me the money to go to California. You know, and, and I go to visit this friend who, who's going to get a tattoo. And he's like, you want to come? I'm like, okay. And he gets this whole sleeve of like Jesus. You know? And then he's like, we go back to his house. We have this barbecue. And these guys are playing like worship music. And he's like, what is this all about? And he's, and he's, he's telling me the story. And he's using like the very words that I, that I had written in the thing. He's like, I had no choice. And I'm like, that's crazy. And then he starts going into the Apostle Paul. Now the Apostle, he's like, you didn't have a choice. I'm like, dude, like reading my mail. So it was, it was pretty wild, but I was just, it was so encouraging to hear, you know, that he's, his heart was just so changed. He's like, I, I, somebody, he goes, the guy prayed. He's like, can I pray with you? He's like, I don't pray. You know, and he's like, well, can I pray for you? He's like, you can do whatever you want. And the guy prays for him. He says, when I woke up the next morning, I was a changed man. He goes, I ran to his house and begged him to come outside and tell me more about this. And I'm just like, that's the power of God, all right? That is the power of God. So it is, it's beyond our comprehension. I don't understand how God works it, how God does it, but it is his, it is his will, and I know his will is good, amen? It's beyond, like I said, but it doesn't make it untrue just because we can't understand it. But does election excuse us from our responsibility to share the gospel? I would simply say it didn't stop Jesus, Right? didn't stop Jesus. He didn't stop sharing his message to all who would listen. Even when the word says that he knew all the hearts, he knew all the people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man and yet he shares the gospel. Still, he went through all uh, all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And Paul doesn't seem too troubled by it either. He trusts that those who come to faith are the elect. They are chosen in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him, he says in Ephesians 1. So I just wanted to dig a little more into that. Um, Not something that I think needs to divide us, but something that should draw us to honor and, and just glory in the power of God. Amen? So here in Titus, Paul says that he's a slave to God for the sake of these people for their benefit, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in the hope of eternal life. So if we look back at that that verse, Paul says he is this for the sake of the faith of God's elect and also for the sake of their knowledge of the truth. And we have this comma which, okay? If you look right there in verse two, comma which. That's called a, uh, a, a relative clause, at least in the ESV. And it gives us more information about the noun that comes before it, okay? The which is the, is the relative pronoun, tells us more about the noun which comes before it, which in this case, um, which is eternal life, okay? So we have which accords with godly, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong comma which. Where am I, verse three? Two, one, truth. Which, oh, okay, the f- verse one, which accords, I'm sorry, not which God, which accords with godliness. So what's the preceding noun? In this case, is knowledge and truth, the two of them, a compound subject, right? Uh, knowledge and truth, which accords with godliness. Sorry about that. And so um, we see that it's faith and knowledge that accord with godliness. That word accord means to be harmonious with or to be consistent with. And I thought that was interesting because we tend to think of godliness as as demonstrated, as a thing that we do, all right? It's demonstrated in action. You act godly. It's a behavior. But faith and knowledge we tend to think of as internal or passive, right? But this tells us that faith and knowledge are harmonious with or are consistent with godliness. In other words, here it is, What you believe and what you know will dictate how you behave. Isn't that truth? And when your faith is in Jesus Christ and your knowledge of him is mature and accurate, you will behave in a way that reflects his presence in your life. And since he's God, when we act in a manner consistent with him, we're said to act godly, right? And we'll see that this connection between faith and that faith demonstrated in how we believe is a central theme as we get through Titus. So what is the end of all this faith and knowledge and and godly behavior? What's the point of it? Now, it's true that it makes the world a much more pleasant place to live in. If everybody behaved godly, it would be a really nice place, right? Um, But as we talked about last week, the gospel is primarily concerned with eternity. And our faith in the here and now is always looking toward the sweet by and by, right? Right? 
Paul says that he is a slave for the sake of the faith and the knowledge of the elect who have their eyes fixed on the sure hope of eternal life. But like I said, this is really one long sentence, so it goes on. He says, the hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, there's bonus information. We get a little information about God. He never lies. He promised, oh, he promised. That's why that information is important. God never lies because he's promising something. And as he's promising something, I need to understand that God's promise is good. He never lies. So which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began or before times eternal and at the proper time manifested in his word. So two verbs attached to our our subject there. God is the subject. Our verbs are promised and manifested. God promised and manifested. God promised eternal life before times eternal. And then he manifested that eternal life in his word. Now a couple quick thoughts here as I wrap it up. First, God promised eternal life before the ages began, the ESV says. The Greek actually says before times eternal. My first thought is, then this can't be a plan B. This can't be an afterthought. God had this planned out. He promised eternal life. God's original design was for man to have eternal life with him. My second thought is, if he promised it before anything was created, who did he promise it to? I don't know why that kind of got me. I was like, who does God, you know, you picture him making a promise, and when you picture somebody making a promise, they're promising to somebody. But like, this nobody was there yet. It was just God. But this is where the beauty and the mystery of the Trinity excites me, right? Because who did God make the promise to? He made the promise to himself. And scripture tells us that God never lies, that he can't lie. Because God is one, but existent in three persons, he can truly have this fellowship with himself. And God can have witness in himself, right? Because what's a promise if nobody knows you made it? Nobody can hold you accountable to it. But God in himself can have witness. John 8, 14, Jesus says, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, he says, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. So God bearing witness to himself is his own testimony because he is three in one triune God. But getting back to those verbs, promised and manifested, the second point is this. Paul tells us that this promise of eternal life has been manifested in the word that Paul has been commanded to preach. In other words, he's saying this gospel that he preaches under the command of God is the very substance of, of the promise that God made regarding eternal life. So I want to look at that. You know, how is the gospel the substance or the manifestation of God's promise of eternal life? In Romans 1.16, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, Paul writes that Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. A little further down there in verse 23, he elaborates on what that gospel is. He says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, people have asked, you know, maybe somebody's even said to you, you know, well, if God's so merciful, God's so loving, why doesn't he do something? about all this sin in the world. But of course, he has done something 2,000 years ago on Calvary. But the truth is, a lot of people reject God. They don't like God. In reality, they've set themselves up as judge over God and determined that his way is not the best way. That they've, they've determined that their wisdom is wiser than God's. That their concept of mercy is more merciful than God's. They're offended by God's forgiveness. They're rankled by his justice. And not to trivialize it, but it, it reminds me of when my kids say they're hungry. You know? Just, this happened just yesterday. They're like, Dad, I'm hungry. And I say, well, there's some almonds Mom put out. Or there's apples in the basket or bananas. And uh, here's, here's some oranges. Here's, here's some raisins. And what do the kids say? That's, no, I'm not hungry for that. No, I'm not. No, that's, they want something else, right? Yeah. And so we get to the heart of it. Listen, we get to the heart of it. Everybody's hungry. And the, the offer of the bread of life is there. 
but some are hungry for something else. God has determined that Jesus should die once for all so that through his blood he might redeem a people for himself. That is a historical fact. It is accomplished. And the promise that God made for eternal life was manifested and testified to in that blood. And it continues to be manifested in the preaching of that truth. That's how we see it manifested. God manifests that eternal life in the preaching of that truth because it is accomplished. Christ died to forgive sinners. This is the gospel, the manifestation of the promise that God made for eternal life before the world began. And Paul, Paul is one of God's ambassadors charged with carrying this message so that the elect of God could be built up in their faith and their knowledge of God so that they can walk in godliness and good works. And Paul's word still speaks to us today that our faith may be you've called us to. So I thank you, Lord, for all of your saints that are gathered here, for all who have ears to hear. I pray, Lord, that more and more would hear. God, that you would excite our hearts and just compel us to share your gospel with boldness to all that we know, that some might come to glory. I praise you for this, Lord. I thank you for this, this family and for your goodness. I ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Saints, we're going to uh, just finish out service with communion and then a final song and then invite you all to.